Bell's inequality. It's a slightly obscure piece of quantum mechanics, but it turns out it really is very important to our understanding of the way the universe works. So the original paper was written in 1964 by John Bell called On the einstein podolsky rosen Paradox. The important issue here is that John Bell essentially took on Einstein and got the better of him. All right. A little bit of background about John Bell. He was from Northern Ireland, died in the early 1990s, I think, but he was quite young. He was only in his early 60s at the time but um, did quite a lot of kind of fundamental work on quantum mechanics, but this is the thing that he's sort of most famous for. So here's his paper. It's a bit intense, I think is the way to describe it, in that there's lots of integral signs and things in there. And it's one of those bits of physics where I kind of struggled to understand it, but I came across this wonderful uh, other paper by a guy called David Mermin, called Bringing Home the Atomic World, Quantum Mysteries for Anybody which actually puts Bell inequality and Bell's theorem, which kind of underlies Bell's work, into a much more understandable framework and gives us an example that we can look at without horrible amounts of maths. David Merman, another famous physicist, famous to most undergraduate physicists because he wrote a book with a guy called Ashcroft, a book called Ashcroft and Merman that lots of people learned their solid state physics from. So he's kind of a bit of a hate figure amongst undergraduates, um, but he's a brilliant guy and comes up with these very clever ways of explaining things. Okay. So that's what we're going to, we use uh, Merman's experiment. We're going to have to back up a little bit further and talk about quantum mechanics and how you measure things in quantum mechanics, right? And so there was a famous experiment from the 1920s by Stern and Gerlach in which they did an experiment to look at the properties of particles when you pass them through magnets. So this is their apparatus where essentially you have a bunch of particles and you pass them between these pair of magnets. And this is kind of an end-on view of what those magnets look like. So it's a very non-uniform magnetic field that you pass them through. They were interested in the angular momentum of these particles as they pass through. And the reason why a magnet allows you to do that is if you've got a particle that's got, say, a spin associated with it, supposing it's rotating, then if it's a charged particle, you've basically got a little current because you've got charge which is moving. And whenever you have a little current loop, you create a little magnet, essentially. And so you can think of these particles as if they were little magnets. And when you put one magnet in a non-uniform magnetic field, the net effect is it exerts a force on it. And depending on which way up that magnet is, it'll make it move in different directions. So they did this experiment on these particles passing through and what they found is when you pass them through this, what's now called a stern gerlach apparatus, the particles split up. And it's just to do with what direction the spin is pointing in. And you can think of them as just little magnets, and it just depends what way up the magnet is, what direction they get moved in. Sorting them. It does sort them. It sorts them in a very discrete way, and that's where the quantum mechanics thing comes in. Because you kind of think, well, if, you, if you've got this thing which is going to sort things, you know, if they're north poles upwards, it'll move them that way, and if they're north poles downwards, it'll move them that way you'd think that if there's something that's kind of in between, it'll move them not kind of not quite so far. That's not what happens in quantum mechanics. Essentially, it's either up or it's down. It's never kind of anywhere in between. If you measure it as being up or down, it'll only be up or down. And so what they found was this unexpected result at the time from quantum mechanics, that instead of finding things kind of spread around all over the place, they split into these two discrete groups of being either up or down. And that's kind of this fundamental thing about quantum mechanical measurement. You tend to get discrete results rather than anything in between. And this is a, a kind of an early example of that. What are the particles going through that magnet then? So in the original stern gerlach experiment, they actually use silver atoms, but there are lots of things. So it's the property that they're picking up is the spin of a particle. And so actually you could do it with electrons, for example. Electrons have a spin. The reason why it doesn't work very well in the sort of classical stern gerlach experiment is because the charge of the electron then interacts with the magnets as well, which just complicates the measurement. But basically there's a whole load of things that will have this. So you can do it with hydrogen atoms, for example. As I say, the original experiment was with silver. But for most of what, the rest of what we're going to talk about, we'll just think about just electrons because it just makes life simpler to think about them because they're kind of isolated particles and we don't have to think about whole atoms or anything like that. Okay. So we're going to use this kind of apparatus quite a lot and in order to avoid having to draw it out every time for the rest of what I'm going to talk about we'll just draw it as an arrow up or down with a question mark next to it. So that's the first bit we need to introduce. Then we need to introduce another bit of quantum mechanics which is a thing called an entangled state. Okay, And so for example, again, let's just think about electrons because it's easier to think about electrons. You can create electrons in this thing called an, an entangled state. Remember the spin's either up or it's down and you can create kind of a pair of electrons which are coupled to each other. So if one of them's up, the other one's down, or if that one's down, that one's up. And usually you kind of create them close together, but then you can move them apart, but they'll still be in this entangled state. So if we go to an experiment, we're creating this entangled state, we then move the electrons apart from each other, 
and then we pass them through one of these sets of apparatus that measures is the spin up or down. It will always come out as either up or down, never anything in between. So you make the measurement, one of them comes out up, the other one comes out down. Or you make the measurement, one of them comes out down, the other comes out up. And that's the only possibilities, that's always what happens with these things. So one of the things you could do is instead of measuring up or down, you could just basically take your experimental apparatus and turn it on its side. And then instead of asking the question, is it up or down, you're asking, is the spin left or right? So you've got well, your entangled pair, we'll leave one of our stone gerlach experiments the same, but we'll turn one of them on its side. And suppose, for example, we measure this particle and it's up. And then the question is, is it left or right? Well, what it really wants it to be is down, right? Because it's measured this one is up and this one's down, but we're not asking that question. We're not asking up or down, we're asking left or right. And the answer is it doesn't care. So if you do this experiment, you'll find if this one turns out to be up, it'll be kind of 50-50 whether it's left or right. And similarly, if this one was down, it's kind of 50-50 whether it's left or right. All right, we've taken our apparatus, we've turned it sideways. Now let's turn it upside down, just to take it to kind of its natural conclusion. So now, again, we're asking, we are actually making the same measurement that we were before, but it's just one of our sets of apparatus is now upside down. So sure enough, if this one's up, this one's going to be down. But because we turned the apparatus the other way up, it's kind of up, upside down. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of the colours I put on these things, right, when this one's red, this one's red too. Just because it's kind of measuring the opposite thing, but with the apparatus upside down. Or it could be that it'll, this one will be down, in which case this one will be up. Again, all of these things are possible. But it all, they always come in these pairs now. Alright, so we've taken the apparatus, we've turned it on its side, we've turned it upside down. Now I want to turn it back a little bit, so it's not quite upside down anymore. Here's the story when we're neither way round particularly. And in particular, I'm going to just turn it to 120 degrees. That's a third of the way round. So now, if this one measures an electron up, then really it wants to measure it down here. But again, we're not quite asking, is it up or down? We're asking something slightly in between. But you can see one of these arrows kind of points downwards. And so what happens is it's just more likely to be downwards than upwards. And in particular, for this 120 degree angle, it turns out that 75% of the time, if this one's up, this one will be pointing downwards, so it'll be the red arrow again. 25% of the time, if this one's red, this one will be green. Okay. And so it's kind of somewhere in between. And if you want the mass for it, a fairly straightforward quantum mechanical calculation, it turns out that if that angle there is theta, then the probability this 25% is the cosine of theta divided by two squared. It's always that formula. Okay, so just to recap, if this one's up, then 25% so of the time this one will be up, in other words, because we turn the apparatus round, it'll be the other colour. And 75% of the time it'll be kind of downwards, so it's the, the same colour, because we turn the apparatus round. One final one of these, I promise. At the moment, all we've done is turn around this apparatus. But of course, we could play around with this apparatus as well. And so the last thing I want to show you is, if this guy's around 120 degrees, if we rotate this one through 120 degrees, essentially we're just doing the same experiment we were doing before because we're just measuring, the apparatus is now measuring the same direction. So it's kind of exactly the same as the first example, but just with your head turned on one side. And so if this one's pointing you know, down to the right, this one will always be pointing up to the left and vice versa. That was a quick canter through quantum entanglements and the ways that you can kind of measure spin from, of the particles that are coming out from it. So now we get to David Merman's brilliant experiment. And in particular, here's, so here is David Merman's machine that he came up with. This is kind of a thought experiment, but it's, you know, it's actually an experiment you really could do in practice, which is, this is the machine that he came up with. It's a box. It has a switch with three positions on the side, and it has two lights on the back, red and green. And if you move the switch to different positions, all you do is you take one of these stern gerlach apparatuses and you turn it through 120 degrees or 240 degrees. Okay, so it's like a third of the way around or two thirds of the way around. And then if you make a quantum measurement of the spin of a particle, remember it'll always come out either red or green. And if it comes out red, the red light goes on. And if it comes out green, the green light goes on. So that's the apparatus that he came up with. And the experiment that he wanted to do with this apparatus is he wanted two of these set up such that you create two particles in a quantum entangled state, send one of them towards this detector, the other one towards this detector. And then all that happens is, depending on where the switch is, you've just got your stern gerlach apparatus in different orientations, and so you'll get different results. And in particular, if the two switches are in the same position, that means that the two stern gerlach apparatuses are, are oriented the same way, either that way or that way or that way, but they're always oriented the same way, which means that if one light's red, the other one's going to be green, 100% of the time, because that's what we've just been showing before. If they're in different settings, that means that they're 120 degrees apart from each other in one orientation or another, and whatever combination you've got of different switches, they're always 120 degrees apart from each other, and that means that the lights are going to be different 25% of the time, they'll be the same 75% of the time. This gets us back to that Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen paradox, right? Because what happens is, somehow, the particles come out in this direction and in this direction, 
and what answer you get is random, right? If, if, let's start with them with the switches being in the same position. So that means that if one's red, the other one's always going to be green. Okay, you can't tell until you make the measurement which one's red, you know, whether it's going to be red this end and green this end or vice versa. Suppose we set up this apparatus so that one of these apparatus is a tiny bit further away. So in fact, the particle arrives at this one a tiny bit before it arrives at this one. That means that if this one is red, then this one's always going to be green. In other words, if this particle spin is up, this particle spin is always going to be down. Somehow, the particle knows what orientation it has to be on, instantly. And you can set things up so that there isn't time for any information to pass from here to here between one measurement and the other measurement. And so somehow, instantly, the information travels from here to here. Ah, that one turned the red light on, so I have to turn the green light on. Not only that, but actually the particle over here knows which orientation to have, not only on the basis of what orientation the other particle had, but what position the switches are in, because the results depend on what the positions of the switches are. And again, if you want to, you can set those switches at the last possible moment, just before you make the measurement. You don't have to set them before the particle is set off, you can set it at the last possible moment. So somehow, instantaneously, the information travels from here to here, not only what orientation that particle was in, but also what position this switch was in, in order to get the right probabilities of answers over here. Einstein really didn't like this, um, because Einstein had a bit of a thing about, you know, things not travelling faster than the speed of light. That's kind of the whole of relativity. Um, and so he referred to this as spooky action at a distance. And in fact, the, this kind of experimental apparatus was what Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen described in their paper as a kind of a paradox, that this can't be the whole story, because it can't just be probabilities, because as far as he was concerned, there was no way that information could travel instantaneously from here to here. And that means that somehow, before the particle set out, they had to have kind of reached some agreement as to which particle was going to do what. Hmm. That's what it seems like to me. They, of course, I, of course, I know what my if I'm up or down because when I last saw my buddy before he left on his journey, yep. I saw what he was. Well, except, except what he is depends is going to depend on what the switch setting is over here, right? And what the switch setting is over here. So you're kind of right. The particles can kind of come to an agreement before they set off as to okay, if this switch is in position one and this switch is in position two, then you do that and I'll do that, and so on through all the possible permutations and combinations. And, and that's a thing called a hidden variable. That's that the, the physics is all set and somehow it's sort of the electrons carry that information with them so that when they arrive at the detectors, they always end up doing the right thing and consistent with each other. And that's what Einstein believed was going on. He thought quantum mechanics can't be the whole story. There have to be these things called hidden variables that somehow the particles are carrying this extra information with them so that then you don't have any faster than light problems because they start, you know, they started close together so they could exchange information and then that information is only revealed later on when you make the measurement. So let's go through that and this, this is where Bell comes in and says okay so let's look at the, what the consequences would be if that was what was going on, if there's one of these things called a local hidden variable that the particles are carrying the information with them, um, what are the possibilities, you know, does that, is that actually consistent with what we see? These are the things that the particles could have decided. So for example, the particle that's heading towards detector A on the left there could have decided, okay, so I'm going to be red if my switch is in position one, red if my switch is in position two, and green if my switch is in position three. And that kind of dictates what the other particle has to do because it always, if the switches are in the same position, it always has to be the opposite. So if it's red for position one, this one has to be green for position one and so on. They could decide any of these things, right? They could decide, they could do different things on different occasions. They could just randomly pick from this list, but this is the menu they have to choose from. Yeah. And they have to pick one of these rows. And as long as they pick from one of these rows, then if the switches are in the same position, everything comes out right. Because if one's red, the other's always green, just because of the way that the symmetry of this thing, or the anti-symmetry of this thing is set up. It works fine if the switches are in the same position. But now what if the switches are in different positions? So one's in position one and the other's in position two, for example. So then we can kind of go through the maths of saying, okay, what fraction of the times are the lights going to be different? So let's pick our, our, the same row here of red, red, green. If this one's in position one and this one's in position two, then they're different colors. So I'll put a tick in there. Okay, if this one's in position one and this one's in position three, you know, they're the, both red, so they're the same color, so we'll put an X. So, so what about two? If it's in position two and position one, then they're different colors. Two and three is another possibility. You know, that's the same color. What else have we got? Three and one, that's the same colour. Three and two, that's the same colour. So it turns out that in two of the six cases, you'll end up with different colours. Okay. 
And it's to almost all of these combinations, actually it turns out you end up with two of six, that you'll end up with different colors, just because you're kind of picking two things out of three. Most of these rows are the same. The only two that are different is if the first particle is decided I'm definitely going to be red, which means the other particle definitely has to be green, and then they'll just always be different, whatever the switch positions are. But if you look at this, it means that suppose, for example, you randomly selected, maybe the, physics, the laws of physics say, okay, before they set off, the particles randomly choose one of these possibilities. And whichever possibility they choose, as I say, if the switches are in the same position, everything's fine. But if the switches are in different position, what fraction of the time are they going to come out to be different colours? And the answer is it's going to be a little bit more than a third, because in almost all of the cases it's a third, but actually in a couple of cases it's six out of six. So it'll be a tiny bit more than a third. OK, so let's try and get it down a little bit less than a third. Maybe it never, the laws of physics are such that it never decides I'm definitely going to be red or definitely going to be green. So you cross out these two then it's exactly a third, because all of these things are a third, so whatever thing you pick, it's going to be a third. It turns out whatever combination you pick, because all these numbers are a third or bigger, whatever the laws of physics are, it'll either be a third or more of the time that the colours come out as different. But remember what the actual experiment was, the actual experiment says quantum mechanics predicts that a quarter of the time the colours should come up different when the switches are in different positions. And so there's a contradiction here, right? there's a paradox, something has to be wrong, because if there is a hidden variable, then it's either a third or more of the time the switches, the, the colours are different. And this is, that's why we have an inequality here. This is this Bell's inequality thing, that it's a third or bigger. Uh, so it's more than a third of the time the colours end up different. Whereas the quantum mechanical prediction is it's a quarter of the time. Um, and so it, one of these has to be wrong. And it turns out if you just go and do the experiment, then it comes up a quarter of the time that the colours are different if the switches are in different positions. So the quantum mechanical prediction is right. The hidden variable prediction, so the quantum mechanics with just probabilities and nothing else, is right. The idea that actually there's some more physics going on here and the things were actually set before things set off gives the wrong answer. It just feels like whatever they're doing, these entangled things, yeah. They're just doing what they're doing and we're setting up all this shrubbery around it and getting ourselves into tears where, like, you know, you're Mike and if, and, if, and if you're just walking along, you're Mike no matter what. And if I start doing all these different experiments like how much hydrogen is in his body or what's he thinking or what's his favourite colour and all that, none of that really matters. You're, just, you're still you and it, isn't it just the same with these particles? Like, you can set up all these devices and try and look at this and that and make lights go off and that, but this they're still just going to do what they're going to do. But that's because I'm not a quantum mechanical particle, right? Mm. And it really is. Uh, so this is really getting to this question of quantum mechanics is full of probabilities. And the question is, are these probabilities reflecting the fact that actually there's some subtler physics going on that we just don't understand? And all we can say is, well, 50% of the time it's going to be that and 50% of the time it's going to be that. And if we were smarter, we could actually predict beforehand, it's definitely going to be that for this one and it's definitely going to be that for this one. Or is it kind of fundamentally unpredictable? Which is what we're kind of told is the case. And that's, that's what Bell showed, right? Einstein said, Einstein really didn't like this idea. He also famously said, right, God doesn't play dice. He didn't like this idea that things were just dictated completely randomly. And his view was there has to be some subtler physics going on, which means that these things are actually definite. What Bell's inequality does is it says, okay, if things are actually definite, then we end up with a result which contradicts what we actually observe. And that's what this very contrived experiment is doing, but it's because you know, the mathematics behind it is complicated, so you have to set up quite a contrived experiment in order to be able to demonstrate that there is this contradiction between a world in which things are really are probabil probabilistic and random in nature, and a world in which they are actually deterministic, we're just not smart enough to figure out what state they're determined to be in. So do I take from this that, in ways beyond understanding, the two particles are communicating with each other instantaneously and, t and Joe's telling Bill, quick flip, you have to flip? Yep, absolutely that. That somehow the information is getting from here to here. Now, people get, as I say, very worried about this because it's like, well, we've got information travelling faster than light. Somehow, instantaneously, what's going on here is affecting what's going on here. But the interesting thing is there is nothing you can do to extract useful information from that. You can't, for example, use it as a way of communicating. Because things are completely random, 
it's like, you, you know, the fact that this guy's come out red, you can't use that to infer or pass any information to somebody over here because that was completely random, which means their answer's completely random. So no information kind of external to the particles gets passed between them in that. So you can't kind of have faster than light communication or anything like that. But something is happening faster than light. Yep. It is. It's happening absolutely instantaneously. Which does make it feel like it was predetermined, but it wasn't predetermined. Exactly that. And that's why, you, you know, at this point your head should start to hurt. That actually it's natural to say, okay, if the information is passing for instantly from here to here, it will be much easier if actually it was all predetermined and you don't need to pass information. But what Bell's inequality shows is that actually if you did set things up ahead of time so that everything is determined, then you get the wrong answer. Because no information's being, no usable information's being passed that you or I could use, but information's being passed, not that electrons have brains, but information's being passed that the electrons need. Yep. <laughs> Are you comfortable with it? With the, the random nature of... The facts of, of the situation here. Uh, it's the way the universe is. And, you know, I guess, you know, I would naturally tend to side with Einstein on this in that I would like things not to be just kind of dicta dictated by, by the flip of a coin. I'd like there to actually be some physics that you could kind of, if we were smart enough, we could get to. But what this experiment and this theory and experiment shows is that there isn't, there really isn't. And as far as we can tell, you know, that things really are this random probabilistic nature rather than being somehow determined in some way we haven't yet been able to figure out. Are things happening in the universe because of entanglement? So there's the whole field of quantum computing, right, which is just coming along now and people thinking about whether we can come up with really clever ways of making very fast computations, which depends on quantum entanglement. Right? A lot of modern cryptography, for example, also depends on entanglement because this is an unbreakable code, right? You know, until you make the measurement, you don't know whether what state things are in. The whole Bell's inequality thing shows as soon as you make the measurement, you kind of fundamentally change things in a way that you wouldn't have done if it were a deterministic thing. So it's sort of fundamental to an awful lot of things that are going on now. But I guess what I'm saying is if there's a whole bunch of particles in the Milky Way that are entangled with a whole bunch of particles somewhere else in the universe and something happens to those particles, I don't know what, something, does that mean the particles here in the Milky Way would react and it could have an implication for us here in our environs. They would. So this is a, another whole area of quantum mechanics as to where you kind of move over from quantum mechanics to kind of a classical universe. And this is idea of decoherence as to how long you can keep things in these entangled states when you move them apart from each other and do other things to them. And it, these entangled states are quite delicate, right? It's quite easy to break them. So it's probably the case that we're not actually affecting goings on in the Andromeda galaxy at the moment because of somebody doing a stern gerlach experiment somewhere in the UK. If some alien species came up with a way of obliterating matter and they, and they obliterated their matter, the entangled matter over this side of the universe could be obliterated as well. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put that out here in your head. <laughs> So you have all these problems that, you know, sometimes your Earth would be over here and the satellite would be over here and they wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. So what you want to do somehow is find an orbit which puts your satellite a decent distance away from the Earth, um, but also kind of keeps station with the Earth as the two orbit around the Sun. So a geostationary satellite is where you've got something which stays above the same point on the Earth. 